Hey, this is Joel Duff, and today I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the role and value of professors. I know that seems a little self-serving, right? I am a professor, professor of biology at a public uh, university in the state of Ohio. Um, but my question is about my particular role and roles of other professors or educators. Should professors at universities or colleges, uh, small colleges or uh, community colleges, should they be active participants in generating and testing ideas, right? Should they be knowledge generators? Or should they be content with just being teachers of what's already known, passing on information that they've learned to the next generation? Most higher educational institutions, such as the one that employs me, they're continually grappling with how to strike some kind of balance between encouraging knowledge creation, all right, new ideas, testing ideas, and the dissemination of past knowledge, all right? What we've already learned and what students need to know about you know, how to accomplish a certain job, right? So let's talk a little bit about that particular balance, the role of educators uh, in this process of passing on information from one generation to another. And I'll say in particular, the importance of them being new knowledge generators uh, for the future and pushing uh, fields of study forward. And I'm also gonna throw in a, what, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite natural historians or natural theologians from the 17th century, John Ray, and his own observations on testing and book smarts and the value of knowledge creation. Let's do all of that coming up. You know, so I said in my intro that I, I'm a professor, professor of biology at a public institution in the state of Ohio. And I, as a faculty member, as a professor, and I would say all educators in higher ed, at some point think about uh, what their particular role is in the academic uh, business or enterprise, right? Are they primarily a knowledge generator? Is that what they've been hired to do? Is that what they want to do, right? Sometimes what we want to do and what we're hired to do aren't always completely uh, in sync with one another. But, you know, you would ask yourself, am I a knowledge generator? Is that what I primarily think of myself as? Or am I just a paid, uh, you know, am I just paid solely to facilitate the communication of knowledge? Right. I've been taught things. I went to college. I learned a whole bunch of stuff. Now I have this head full of knowledge and I'm just going to take this knowledge now and I'm going to take it out of myself and put it in these other students' brains, right? And I'm just communicating that information. So I am a passer of information from generations past to generations future. Now, that's an aspect really that does exist for all educators. We are taking past information and moving it into the future. But if that's all that ever happened, that would be a rather static to create a, 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 a form of a, a static future, right? In the sense that you wouldn't have progress or uh, continuing uh, expansion of our knowledge. So who are the knowledge creators? They don't all have to come from universities, obviously, but universities and places of higher education often have taken on that role of researching, synthesizing, generating new ideas, testing new ideas. All right, how my university administrators like answer the question though, how they view me is gonna go a long way to determining like, you know, what my uh, roles are at the university. Like what's my teaching load? How much time do I actually spend in the classroom disseminating information or mentoring students and so forth? Versus how much time am I spending doing research, thinking, reading, you know, interacting with people that are my peers uh, and working on that form of research, right? What are future hires going to look like? How do we decide who we're going to hire next? What kind of ratio are they, of, of interest are they going to have and what, and what we're going to force them to have? And really, really bluntly, let's just say, if professors are, if all they are, if all I was, was just a book smart knowledge disseminating vehicle, in other words, I'm just full of knowledge and my job is just to, put that knowledge in future heads, then really there isn't any need to have me be a tenure-tracked uh, research faculty member, right? 
I don't need to be a full professor paid more than an adjunct faculty or a lecturer because a lecturer can disseminate that information potentially just as well, if not better than I am. Some people might argue better because they're spending all their time being a good teacher. Um, so they're going to work at a lower salary, have a lot more students. And so it's more efficient from a business model, right? In terms of just dissemination of information. So hmm, knowledge generators have to spend some time uh, justifying their existence, right? Because they're not really as efficient from an economic model at the, at the institution level. So a university, of course, could just decide to go the route, like, and some, some institutions are this way, right? A lot of community colleges are. They're in the business of teaching past knowledge to future generations, All right? But again, as I said, you know, that comes at a cost, right? There are costs to sort of this static nature of just passing on information from generation to generation to generation uh, without assessing that information and generating new knowledge. All right, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I, um, I think all faculty go through either phases through their career in which they're doing one thing more than another, um, or they're in institutions where they're sort of compelled to do one of these particular jobs or another. Um, but I, wanna, I do want to address the question here of like, what's the value, I'll say, of knowledge creation? And these questions of the balance of knowledge creation versus knowledge dissemination, these are fundamental questions about the purpose and value of educational institutions, right? And these questions are nothing new. They've been around for a long time. They go through different machinations and iterations. Uh, today with the internet, all these things are exposed again because students now have more choices in terms of where they get information. And of course, there's this whole aspect of students also think they know what they need. And so in some ways, institutions have to kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the clientele. And so we kind, of, uh, we kind of provide what we think students need. But on the other hand, we also feel like students don't always know what exactly they need, and we need to provide them things that even though they think they don't need them, they really do need them, and that's really hard to balance as well. All right, anyway, I'm getting off track here. And concerning how and by whom new knowledge is generated, I was really struck by a quote from my favorite natural historian slash natural theologian from the 1700s. All right, and that is John Ray, or Johannes Reyes. And uh, in reading his book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation, which is his, his most famous um, uh, piece of work, uh, in the 1735 edition, we find John Ray. Now, concerning how and by whom new knowledge is generated, I was really struck by something I read uh, in John Ray's book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. This is a book from the 1735, but really from John Ray's, John Ray's uh, life and work uh, in the uh, late 1600s. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about John Ray, because he's my favorite natural historian. Uh, and then I want to read this quote, and I'm going to use this quote to sort of expound upon the idea of the importance of knowledge generation and how we go about doing that. So first of all, I have to point out, so here's John Ray. Um, and there's the, the inset uh, from his book, the, the Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. John Ray is considered one of the preeminent natural historians, uh, an English natural historian from the late 17th century. Uh, and this other book to the side here, the three Fisco theological discourses. You can see the three main portions of this book are the primitive chaos, the creation of the world. So his thoughts on the origins of the earth, uh, the general deluge, its causes and effects. So he's talking about Noah's flood there and the dissolution of the world and future conflagrations. All right. Now that's the uh, that's the end of the world. So there's a book that's going to cover it all. all right? <laughs> the natural history of the world. All right. Past or beginning all the way to the very end. Um, and John Ray uh, is in a very interesting moment in time. Um, I've used this history of the ideas timeline in the past. It's something I create to talk to my students about uh, where we're talking in history uh, for a couple of my different classes. Uh, and so here's John Ray right here. Yeah, let me get my pen out. 
So here we have John Ray right here in the late 1600s. John Ray sits at a point that's after the Copernican Revolution. All right, and he, he does believe that the, the earth is uh, rotating around the sun and the sun is part of a, of a larger universe and the sun isn't necessarily or isn't at the center of the universe either, right? So he's, he's, a, he's the child of the Copernican Revolution. Uh, and he's deeply embedded in what is, what is coming to be the, uh, the full um, synthesis of the scientific uh, method. All right. So the getting close to the end of the, what's called the scientific revolution, which sort of finds its its end point or I'll say culmination. All right. In 1687, when Isaac Newton published his book uh, on the laws of motion and universal gravitation. All right. And it's at that point right there in the middle of John Ray's life that you kind of have like what science is, you know, how science functions, sort of the the how the scientific method works, the the logic of science is well developed by this point. And so he's living at the same time as Newton, uh, Woodward and Burnett are, are others that discuss the, uh, the whole history of the earth, which is one of the reasons John Ray discussed the history of the earth. There's a huge amount of interest in that because you can see, I also have labeled here, the discovery of deep time. John Ray is right here at the end of his life, at the very beginning of when people were starting to realize the earth might be more than 6,000 years old. Uh, and that's my interest in John Ray. He's a fascinating person to read because he is grappling with the idea of the world might be older than 6,000 years, and that's hard for him to wrap his head around. And yet, using the scientific method that he is now ensconced in, he is seeing that that's exactly what might be true. And he's... he's um, He's now applying that to like, how do I understand this with within the context of past ideas and what's happening right now? All right. So anyway, John Ray is writing and he is a essentially you can think of him as an academic, uh, one of the primary academics of his time. He is giving papers and he's doing research and and writing and communicating to others. He is he is an absolute knowledge generator. Don't have time to go through all the things that he, he actually uh, started and is known for, but a lot of stuff. So John Ray writes toward the end of his career, kind of the culmination of, of his activities is his science. This book, The Wisdom of God, manifested in the works of creation. See, John Ray is a natural theologian, right? He's studying nature in order to understand the aspects and the wisdom of God. As opposed to if you were just studying scriptures, you'd be learning about God that way. That would be how you were developing your theology. Uh, and so he's looking at the world and trying to understand God's creation. And in that activity, in, in this book, um, there's a whole bunch of quotes that I'm going to share eventually, but this, this is the one I wanted to start with. Um, he's talking about the academics of his day. Basically saying, here's what's happening at academic institutions in the different various fields that I'm interested in. And he sees kind of a malaise occurring, you know, in the late 1600s. Uh, and that malaise is that he sees that people are not really interested in generating new knowledge. They're becoming, um, the, the academics are just becoming knowledge disseminators, right? They're just teachers. They're just passing information to the next generation and they're not really analyzing that. They're, well, the, his biggest problem is they're not really assessing the accuracy of that information. They're just taking what they were taught, not questioning it, and passing it to the next generation. Uh, and kind of strangely, he actually has kind of a model, uh, if you read beyond this quote, it's, it's almost as if it's like mutating over time, right? If you learn something and then you don't quite pass it along the same way, then the next person learns it, they pass it on. It's like a game of telephone and stuff changes over time. So he's saying you need to, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm gonna, this is all gonna be part of the quote, but um, yeah, let's just get right to it. Uh, it. It's as if like in a game of telephone, things change. He's saying like, you know what? You can't just be a passer of information. You cannot just pass information from one generation to the next, to the next because it's going to, uh, ultimately, it's going to decay in a way. You need to be constant, constantly assessing the information we have. You need to be testing those ideas all the time. And if you're testing those ideas, chances are you're actually going to generate new knowledge. Right, let's get to the quote. And this is in fairly old English, so I will try to uh, interpret for you. 
Let us not suffice us to be book learned, to read what others have written, and to take upon trust more falsehood than truth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was taught this. I've got this great book knowledge, other stuff other people have written, but I'm just trusting my professor. All right. But it could well be that I'm learning more falsehood than truth. But let us ourselves, let us ourselves examine these things as we have opportunity. And he's actually telling students, too, of his time, not just other faculty, but he's actually informing students, people who are at the university are doing this stuff, right, learning. You need to take it upon yourself to examine those things when you have an opportunity and converse with nature as well as with books. Now, he's talking about the sciences. We're mostly talking about the sciences here. So he's saying, like, you can't just learn about nature by reading a book which tells you here's what we know. You got to go out there and you have to observe it for yourself. Read about in the book, go out, and then, like, does it match? Does, does it all equate? If I collect data, collect information with my eyes or whatever, does it match? Does it make it? Let us endeavor to promote and increase this knowledge and make new discoveries. Not so much distrusting our own parts or despairing of our own abilities as to think that our industry can't add anything or add nothing to the invention of our ancestors or correct any of their mistakes. Don't think that, God, you know, my ancestors knew a lot. Like, this is amazing. I'm reading this stuff. And people know so much. And they seem to have figured it all out. And I don't have the ability to actually come up with new ideas and generate new, new knowledge. Right? No, they made many mistakes and you need to correct them and you need to have confidence that you can learn more and go beyond your ancestors. Let us not think that the bounds of science are fixed like Hercules pillars and inscribed with the ne plus ultra, the perfect and most extreme example of the kind, the ultimate. Imagine being back in the late 1600s and thinking, God, we're so advanced now. We like know everything. Well, like, look at this Newton guy and all that. We know about gravity and the planets and like this is a, you know you feel like you're on the pinnacle. Like how can I, how can we go farther than that? Don't you think there are people today who think like eh, like everything's been to, you know what is new to learn? We can make better cell phones and computers, but in terms of these other areas, what's new to be learned from philosophy or history or English or or, or even mathematics or, or, you know, chemistry. Let us not think that we have done, that we have done when we have learned what they have delivered to us. Don't think you're done learning when you've just learned everything that you've been told from the past. You've read every book. You know everything there is to know. The treasures of nature are inexhaustible. Here is employment enough for the vastest parts and the most indefatigable industries, the happiest opportunities, the most prolific and undisturbed vacancies. What's all this about? He's saying, look, the creation is vast. It's incredibly complicated. It doesn't matter how long you study or uh, it doesn't matter how long we have to study and how hard you're never going to plumb the complete depths of it. There's always something new to learn. It's inexhaustible. There's employment enough for all of you to continue to add to the knowledge of this world. You can continue to generate and create new knowledge forever and never run out of new things to learn. Much might be done, would we but endeavor, and nothing is insuperable to pain and patience. I know that a new study at first seems vast, intricate, and difficult, but after a little resolution and progress, after a man becomes a little acquainted, in other words, you actually become acquainted with what you're looking at, as I may to say, with it, his understanding is wonderfully cleared up and enlarged the difficulties vanished and the thing grows easier and familiar. I mean, all this is just to say like, hey, if you uh, if you're you can read about nature and you can think this stuff is all really complicated. Let's think like Newton's talking about uh, the laws of, of motion. Uh, and it's like, oh, that's they, that's a lot for me. I can just like barely understand that. But no, if you go out and you become familiar with it. I mean, you, in, in, you ensconce yourself in that particular field. You make your own observations. You begin to learn it and understand it at a very personal level. 
And so you're saying you become a corporate, then you begin to understand it and it becomes cleared, right? Wonderfully cleared and enlarged. The difficulties vanish and the thing grows easy and familiar. And at that point, then you then begin to add knowledge. This is the hard thing to get students to do, right? Is to not just say I've memorized the information, but I've, I've become to know it well enough that I now feel comfortable with it. And now I can apply that knowledge, right? Not simply bring it back to my memory and just like hope that I do well enough. And for our encouragement in this study, observe what the psalmist says in Psalm 111, verse 2. The works of the Lord are, are great. Sout out, out of all of them that have the pleasure therein. The works of the Lord are great. Don't think that uh, we know it all, right? Which, though it be principally spoken of the word of providence, in other words, he's mostly saying you can continue to study the scriptures your entire life and you can't plumb those depths, right? There's always something new that you'll see the next time you look at it. And, you know, 400 years later, we can still say that. Um, Yet many as well be verified of the works of creation. In other words, creation is the same way. That's a handiwork of God. And it is also very, its, it's works are great. And it's going to be hard for you to plumb the depths of those. I am sorry to see too little account made of real experimental philosophy. Now, experimental philosophy here is, is different than the technical meaning of experimental philosophy today. Experimental philosophy to this, in this case, just means... Um, doing experiments, all right? Real world, actual observations and working with things, not just looking at books and saying, okay, now I understand that, right? Relearning the same information that's in books with your, through your own personal experience. All right, so I'm sorry to see too little account made a real experimental philosophy in this university, all right? Where I am here right now, here's the problem. And that those ingenious sciences of mathematics labored at are so much neglected by us. In other words, look over there at the math department. They're still like working out new formulas, right? They're constantly, you know, math at the time of the late 1600s is, is really a burgeoning field in the sense that, uh, especially with uh, Newton stuff, right? Math is really at the center of being able to understand a bunch of different things about the physical world. All right, it's the queen of the sciences, right? It's at the core of everything. And, and it's still making discoveries, like how to use math to, to, to do things. And therefore, do earnestly exhort those that are young, especially gentlemen, to set upon these studies. They may possibly invent something of immense, imminent use and advantage to the whole world. And one such discovery could abundantly compensate the experience and travel of one man's whole life. In other words, you could spend, right? And he's saying, you could spend your whole life working on some particular problem uh, or a bunch of different things. And you could be doing, and, and maybe a lot of it doesn't work out. And that might not seem like it's worth your time. Now, you can't just decide I'm going to make some discovery, right? You have to get yourself involved in things and discoveries may come. Sometimes they may not come, but over your whole lifetime, you could make such one single discovery in one short period of time that would abundantly compensate for all that experience, all the travels you did during your whole life. Rather than just sitting down and saying, here's what I've been taught, here's what I know, and I'm just going to give that to the next generation like I'm a faithful servant, I'm just going to hold on to this knowledge, give it to the next generation, pass down the buck. I don't want to like take any chances here. However, it is enough to maintain and continue what is already invented. Neither do I feel that what more ingenious and manly employment they can pursue, tending more to the satisfaction of their own minds and the illustration of the glory of God, for he is wonderful in all his works. All right, he's tying this back to you like, if God created this wonderful universe for us, um, how can you say that you don't want to know more about that, Right. You can say, like, you should be studying his scriptures and learning more. You can always learn more about God's nature and himself as you study that word. Uh, as you study nature, you should be able to do the same thing. And to just say, like, this is all I need to know and to just pass it on to the next generation and not try to learn something more is like saying, I don't want to know more about God. That's basically what he's boiling it down to here. So he's like, you don't actually want to know the God of creation. You don't want to explore that. 
And that's actually wrong because that brings glory to God. Unf man, uh, understanding more about God's world and, the un and then therefore unfolding and showing and expressing the amazingness of the creation, all right, actually brings glory to the God of creation. Uh, not doing that is to basically take away what is God's, which is should be his glory. Uh, I'm about out of time and I have to run, so I got to wrap this up pretty quickly. I just I just remember reading this book uh, a few years back, and I was really struck by this this section and several other sections as well that really stressed the importance of learning new things, constantly being a new learner. Um, and by learning new things and applying what you learn to new problems, in that way, you are a knowledge generator, all right? You are a knowledge creator. Um, and it's not just all about collecting data, but it's also taking ideas and generating new ideas, all right? Or taking the knowledge that exists now and applying it to ideas in different ways. Uh, and I think that I'm, uh, I think one of the things that really, that's really one of the most satisfying things about the job is it's not just here's what I learned and now I'm just repeating this information again, but it's like I'm constantly thinking through the things I've learned, how to communicate those, but then also I'm constantly applying them to new situations that are in this world today that are unlike anything in the past. Uh, and then there's also the aspect of, well, I mean, like this very video and the other videos that I'm making and my blog posts and so forth, those other interests that kind of like are sort of part of like who I am in terms of being an educator, but are also like out of technically outside of my job. But nonetheless, they are a, an outgrowth of my interest in being a communicator of information, but also at the same time exploring and ideas. Part of what I'm doing in these videos is I, it's not like a script I've written out that I'm just like going to disseminate to you. But in my mind, I'm exploring these ideas as I'm talking. And there's nothing more intellectually sort of stimulating than that. Right. I mean, be, I, I guess you could say if I'm having a conversation about this, it'd be more stimulating. Uh, but nonetheless, to have to to have to talk out loud about things is a way of thinking through and generating new ideas and ways to approach problems. Uh, and John Ray saying, don't get static, right? Don't get sort of set in your ways. And especially this idea of if you just think, if you just trust that past generations like have the knowledge, um, they could have been wrong, right? A lot of people are wrong about a lot of things. We need to constantly test, constantly test things, even things that we think we're sure we're right about. And when you stop doing that, that's the sure way to actually make sure that you are going to disseminate misinformation, right? Constantly testing our ideas. And here we see John Ray 400 years ago talking to students and other faculty saying, basically, get off your butts. Stop just being like philosophers. Like I got all, I mean, I have this uh, knowledge and I just sit in my chair and now I think about it. Actually go out, participate in the world collect information, generate new ideas, and test those ideas against the things that you see in this world. Um, and this is where he really is the, you know, he is growing out of this scientific revolution uh, and is part of a real exploration that's really beginning here in terms of like, what is the history of the earth? How do we really understand that? How should we study that? Uh, we can't just rely on past ideas uh, because he's he's finding out himself as I look out in the world, the things I was taught when I grew up and I was being taught by a professor, they're wrong. Right. As I apply that information, they're wrong. <sighs> All right. Um, I have to go. And so which means I have to say goodbye. All right. Talk to you later. Bye bye.